Oh, everyone can hear me, I hope. <laughs> um, this is the story of Kathleen Ellis, uh, pioneer daughter and Canadian nursing leader. You may be asking me why I decided to um, look into the life of Kathleen Ellis. And it began um, about 19, uh, 2020, uh, which was declared the year by the World Health Organization of the Nurse and Midwife. And I thought it would be really interesting to um, select uh, one of the local nurses. And I knew about Kathleen Ellis. I knew that she was the daughter of the Pioneer Ellis family, uh, that she was a nurse. Uh, I knew she was superintendent of nurses at the Vancouver General Hospital, and that she had been um, one of the people that helped to establish the University School of Nursing in Saskatchewan. But I didn't know a lot about her other than that. So I visited the uh, Penticton archives and looked through the Ellis records and received some information about her. And then I contacted Francis at our, in our archives in BC History of Nursing and he sent me copies of her biographical file, which were wonderful information. And so I then uh, decided to put together uh, the story of Kathleen Ellis. The first thing that happened was I wrote an article for the um, Okanagan Historical uh, Society, and it was published in 2020. And then last summer, the Penticton Museum asked me if I would do a presentation on Kathleen at their Brown Bag Lecture Series. And I did that in November. And now I'm presenting to you today on Kathleen Ellis. Uh, I will be talking a little bit about her early history in um, Penticton um, because I believe that her childhood really influenced her nursing career. And I think it's important to talk a little bit about her family and her history. Her parents were actually uh, Tom and Wilhelmina Ellis. They married in Dublin, Ireland in January of 1872. Now, it's interesting about Tom. He had arrived in uh, British Columbia as a young man, about 17 or 18 years of age, and uh, was quite the uh, entrepreneur, a very acute um, businessman. Uh, he had accumulated some cattle and horses, and he was looking for a place to settle because he had a sweetheart, you know, Wilhelmina back in Ireland. Ireland and he wanted to bring her to Penticton. So he looked for a place to settle. His first visit to Penticton was not good. He didn't like it. Uh, he decided, no, this wasn't the place for me. I'm not going to settle here. He came back again in the second look. Maybe it was the time of the year. But anyway, he saw the two beautiful lakes, Skaha and Okanagan, the Okanagan River flowing through. He's, the land was fertile. There were lots of um, bunch grass for his cattle and horses to munch on. And there was lots of wildlife. So he decided, yes, this would be perfect. So he purchased some land and built a two-room cabin. And then off he went to Ireland and married uh, Wilhelmina. They uh, had a brief holiday, arrived in New Westminster, and then made a seven-day trip by horseback to their new home in Penticton. They probably visited along the way some pioneer families in um, Hope, Princeton, Carameenas before arriving in um, Penticton. When they arrived, it didn't look quite like this because when they arrived, uh, there was no roof on the cabin. So I'm hoping that Wilhelmina knew that she was arriving somewhere that didn't have a roof. And hopefully it was in the summertime. This uh, ca uh, little cottage was nestled very close to a small stream. It faced west. Uh, and of course. Now this is just shows you a little bit about where it was. This was their actual house here, the, uh, the Ellis Homestead. And um, there was a, a stream here that was, that Tom had redirected so they had some water coming by their cabin. Right here was where they actually, uh, he and his wife built the first Anglican church just on the edge of their property. Okanagan Lake is over here. These are other, some of the creeks. This is Ellis Creek named after the Ellis family. Now, as far as the Ellis children, there are a total of uh, nine children. 
Kathleen uh, was the eighth, and she's the baby here in the photo. The youngest um, daughter had not yet been born. Um, she, the children um, were there two boys and eight girls. Um, the, they're actually, uh, the children, which was fortunate, all survived childhood, which was quite amazing for the time when there was quite a high infant mortality. The only sad thing was that the oldest boy um, died at the age of 20 in a, uh, he was actually in a, uh, his horse butt and he was killed, which was very sad. Otherwise, all the children survived well into adulthood. The children learned to ride as almost as early as they learned to walk. Uh, Kathleen said that the Salish children were her friends. And Tom said that his girls were good cowboys when they rode after the cattle uh, on the ranch. The Ellis children, these are their records. This is Kathleen's hand, uh, record of her siblings with their uh, names and their birth dates and their death rates. Um, Five, three of the children were born in Penticton, the mayor home birthed. Five of them were born in New Westminster, and the youngest, Eva, was born in Ireland. Kathleen wrote that her father officiated as the doctor, nurse, and midwife with the help of, and I'll use the term Indian because that's what was used in these records without any disrespect for the term itself. Now, why did they go to New Westminster? For delivery. Well, the only hospital that I could find was the Royal Columbian Hospital. That was the first hospital to open in British Columbia, and the children were probably born there, as far as I could determine. This shows a little bit. Now, this was a really exciting journey for the children because when a new baby was expected, the children would take off on horseback as a family and they would travel to Northminster. And this is what was called the Duny Trail, which follows very much the route of Highway 97 today. Would start out south of uh, Penticton, travel to Carameas, Princeton, to Hope, and then from Hope down to New Westminster. Um, this was exciting for them. They look forward to that visit each time the baby was going to be arrived. Now, Kathleen's birth registration is interesting in that it states that no doctor was present, an Indian woman only. She was born at home. Uh, and the other interesting things was that this was actually, wasn't registered until the 1930s by her sister. This is the original um, birth registration for her. Now, when um, Kathleen was five, this is a look at the Ellis homestead at that time with the white picket fence. Those are probably some children that are sitting on the lawn here. It was a very busy place. Tom had um, a reputation for wanting a full day's work from his employees with no place for idleness. And this work ethic, I think, really influenced Kathleen. This just shows um, the cherry tree. Ellis was, Tom Ellis was uh, actually recorded as being the first person to plant cherry trees in the Okanagan. And this is just a photograph of that. Now, this is really a treasure. I will explain it to you in the archive. Uh, you often find a treasure in spite of looking through financial records and minutes, which can be really tedious. Sometimes you find something just remarkable. And this was a notebook that was written by Kathleen when she was six. And as you can see, it belongs to uh, Kathleen Wilhelmina Ellis. And this was, this was a, a a drawing of their house. It's a child's drawing, of course, but what's interesting are you know, the flowers that are here, but what's really interesting are the animals. Now the children had many pets. Uh, they had lambs and calves and birds. I'm sure they had dogs. Uh, and they also had a bear cub. And this was an interesting story, a sad story actually. Uh, the bear cub was really cute when it was little, but as it grew, it got quite aggressive. And so Kathleen wrote in her memoir, 
that they had to kill the bear cub. But the worst story is that they then ate it. <laughs> so uh, I'm sure that's what happened, you know, with farm families. You know, you lived off the land and you didn't waste. So, and she didn't have any um, misgivings about the fact that they had to kill the bear and eat it. The uh, next note is about homeschooling. Uh, and she says here, um, I don't go to school because there isn't one, but my tutors are my mom, Wilhelmina, and sometimes she teaches me too. So the children, because there was no school, were taught by governesses and tutors, sometimes by the minister, and sometimes by their uncle Wade, who was Wilhelmina's um, brother who had arrived in Penticton. Uh, and when the girls were old enough, uh, they were sent to boarding school in England to further their education when they were probably about nine or 10. There was no mention in the records of what happened to the sons. I assume that they were homeschooled um, and then worked with their father on looking after the ranch. Um, Kathleen also mentions that they had lots of books in the house and she was an avid reader. The next little picture is about the sick pigeon. Uh, once um, Uncle Alfred, which Alfred Wade, gave me one of his pigeons that was sick and I made it better and it flew away. Maybe a little bit of looking forward to her next, her career as a nurse. Anyway, she looked after the pigeon and she was very happy about that. The next one I really like because I think this is a picture of a nurse. Because look at the cap. I think that's a nurse's cap. Um, I should say that at this time, there were no hospitals. There were no nurses. Um, and the first doctor didn't arrive till 1902. Wilhelmina, the mother, uh, had a medical chest and a very bulky medical textbook. And she was described as being skilled in practical nursing. And she assisted anyone who arrived at the ranch who needed help, whether they were European or indigenous, that didn't matter. She would help whoever arrived and needed assistance. And the Indigenous people, I'm sure the women in particular, would have shared their knowledge with the Wilhelmina and she would have shared hers with them. Kathleen mentions too that she learned from the children as well because they were her playmates. She had no one else. The nearest neighbors were right 30 miles away. So she played with the Indigenous children and they taught her how to kill rattlesnakes. And she mentions that when they had picnics down at the lake, uh, that it wasn't unusual for her to kill five or six rattlesnakes who were there sunning themselves on the sand at the lake shore. And I hate snakes, so that sounds terrible to me. Um, okay. This just shows you a photograph of the Ellis House in winter. And there was, of course, additional buildings now. They had outhouses and sheds and all kinds of storage areas, picket fence, etc., and the trees, the cherry trees. Now, Kathleen, when she reached the age, you know, of a, a teenager, right, about age 12 or so, uh, was supposed to go to England for her high school education. Well, you need to know a little bit about Kathleen because this is something that recurs throughout her whole life. She said, I'm not going to England. She stamped her feet and said, no way am I going to go to England. I'm a Canadian and I am going to be educated in Canada. So uh, she was enrolled in the Havergal College in Toronto, which was a very prestigious school, day school and boarding school for girls, and it still exists today. She was provided with a wardrobe, which her mother and she had decided would be quite appropriate. However, when she arrived, she was told it was unacceptable and she would have to get I know a new one. Well, she said, no, if it's good enough for Penticton, it's good enough for Toronto. However, uh, 
she had to get a new wardrobe and her mother intervened and a new one was provided for her. That tells you a little bit about Kathleen. When, after she graduated, she returned um, to Penticton. Um, this was in 1905. And at this time, Tom had decided to sell his vast uh, property and it was time to retire. Uh, he had decided to move the family. Uh, the address I got was 101 Gorge Road, but I couldn't find it on a map uh, in Victoria. Kathleen was now 18. And so the property, all his properties, of which he had quite extensive ones, at one point he has actually ranched, reached all the way from Naramata all the way down to Asorius. He had, you know, stores in the post office and he had a, um, you know, all sorts of properties. Um, this, it was sold for $400,000 in the year 1905, which would be about $13 million today. So the family moved to Victoria. And just to note, if you remember that Wilhelmina did die in 1911 and Tom in 1918 when they were in Victoria. As far as Kathleen was concerned, she didn't like living in Victoria. She said she was bored to tears there. Well, she was so, her mind was so active. She was tired of the tea parties and the uh, golf and French lessons that she had to endure. And I'm sure, although nothing was mentioned about it, being a single woman, I'm sure that some suitors were paraded in front of her. As we know, she never married. Um, she may have been looking after her mother during this time too, because she died in 1911. And then she decided that she was going to be a nurse. Well, a real, real battle rose over this one because particularly her father, Tom's, in no way was she gonna be a nurse. This wasn't the proper education for her, you know, well-bred, educated, you know, middle-class or high-class uh, woman. There was no way he was going to allow her to be a nurse. Mind you, she was 25 this time, but she wasn't independently wealthy at this point. She was very dedicated, and she won that battle, just like she won the she won other battles and not going to England. So what she did was she um, enrolled in the John Hopkins School of Nursing in Baltimore. Now, why did she choose to go there? Which was a question I had, because there were schools of nursing at that time in Victoria, Vancouver, Winnipeg, and Toronto. Um, now, this uh, John Hopkins School of Nursing was probably the most prestigious one in North America and probably would have provided more educational opportunities. And it, as some of you, you know, history buffs know, it was founded by Adelaide Nutting and it was uh, Isabel Hampton Robb and Lavinia Dock, if some of those names are familiar to you. So it became a model for nursing education. Now, over the period of Kathleen's nursing career, she was very astute in deciding upon where she would work and where she would become educated. Now, perhaps when she was in Toronto, she may have heard about the John Hopkins, I don't know, but she did go there and she graduated three years later. This is um, just a picture for interest of a patient ward in John Hopkins with nursing students. We can see this would be a student because of the uh, the colored sleeve, uh, sleeves. We know this is probably the right period because of the length of the uniforms. A very typical open ward. It's very staged, of course, but uh, that would be very typical of open wards. And I remember being on one like this at VGH when I was a student there in the 1950s. In fact, it was many years before VGH finally closed these open wards. Um, Kathleen returned to uh, Victoria and then she had a job as matron 
of the um, Vancouver Island Military Hospital. Now, the Esquimalt Hospital in 1894 uh, was established to care for sailors who were employed in coastal defense. In 1910, the Canadian Naval Service was established and the federal government took over the running of the hospital and it was used during World War I for returning uh, veterans. And for the next year, she was supervisor of the operating rooms at the Henry Ford Hospital in Detroit. And at the top, it says, was used for booze and dope. Victims come first in Henry Ford's new hospital. He um, actually established this hospital, as it says, to give employees a new chance. And in Detroit, it was built by Henry Ford. Employees who were drug um, victims uh, will be given expert treatment and a new chance to make good on their jobs. It was interesting for her to work there. She was there just for the one year. And then her next job in 1921 was assistant um, second assistant at Toronto General Hospital School of Nursing, another very important hospital in Canada. And some of you may know that there was a lot of rivalry between the Toronto General and uh, VGH actually over the years. And while she was there uh, in Toronto, uh, she probably through the nursing network uh, heard that the University of British Columbia had opened uh, a school of nursing and that Ethel Johns had been appointed um, the head of the school and the superintendent of nurses at VGH. She had a dual position. And she probably also heard that Ethel Johns was contemplating resigning as superintendent of nurses at VGH. And I think she saw this as an opportunity to maybe get involved in this new program and find out what was going on. Again, she's very astute actually. So she applied, and Ethel Johns did retire in 1921 to become a full-time um, uh, head of the School of Nursing at VGH. She applied for the job and she was appointed to this position. So from 1921 to 1929, she was superintendent of nurses and principal of the School of Nursing at the Vancouver General Hospital, which had one of the largest schools of nursing in Canada. And this is just a picture of what VGH uh, looked like at this time. Um, I think that, um, this, uh, I think, initial exposure that Kathleen had to the implementation of this university program with the, uh, with the fact that the UBC students had all of their clinical experience at VGH, I think she saw this as this exposure to higher education for nurses, and I think it really sparked her later interest and drive to establish a nursing school of nursing in Saskatchewan. She worked very closely with Ethel Johns, who actually retired in 1925, um, and is making uh, this program really quite successful. This uh, next one just shows you uh, the graduation class at DGH in 1926 with Kathleen Ellis here in the center. Uh, VGH had the second largest number of, of nursing students in Canada at this time. And in this picture, there are 60 graduates. While she was in BC, Kathleen was really involved in professional nursing associations, which she carried out throughout her entire nursing career. She was president of the Vancouver um, Graduate Nurses Association and also president of the Graduate Nurses Association of BC. I think this network kept her up to date on provincial and federal nursing um, events. In 1929-30, she did something really quite different. She decided to take off to London, England and to uh, get a certificate in public health nursing at Bedford College in London, England. Um, and she had resigned, I said, from her position at VGH. Now, why did she choose um, 
public health nursing. And I wondered about that. And I wondered if it was because the UBC nursing program had a very strong influence on public health nursing. And in fact, in 1920, a very successful diploma program was established. And her experience had all been in hospital nursing and she hadn't really, I don't think had much experience in community nursing. She may have seen this as a gap in her nursing education and felt that maybe she should find more about um, public health nursing. So why not go to England who had a much larger and vast experience in this field than in Canada. Now, while she was there, she visited other European countries. I should mention that she was able to do this because when her father died, she was left a legacy of $40,000 which in today's uh, money would be about a million dollars. So she was quite financially independent and so could pursue these um, educational experiences and, the, and she could travel to Europe and visit these other countries and see how they were managing their public health programs. From 1930 to 1935, she was director of nursing at the Winnipeg General Hospital and vice president of the Canadian Nurses Association. As I said, she was very clever. She went again to a very you know, well-known and respected hospital, the Winnipeg General Hospital. I mean, Ethel Johns had graduated from that. So it was really well-known. And so she was director there and vice president of the Canadian Nurses Association. Definitely her interests were in nursing education and nursing administration. Now, in 1935 to 37, she decided to pursue a Bachelor of Science degree. And where did she go? But to the prestigious Teachers College at Columbia University in New York City. Again, she selected probably the best known um, College of Nursing in North America uh, to achieve this um, degree. Again, very clever in where she went. Um, and I think that she and her had her sights on the idea that Manitoba and Saskatchewan were all contemplating uh, establishing a university school of nursing. And if she wanted to pursue this, she would need to have a nursing degree. So she pursued this. So for the next 13 years, Kathleen um, was, uh, had the dual position of registrar of the Saskatchewan Registered Nursing Association and director of the School of Nursing at the University of Saskatchewan in Saskatoon. This is just a picture for interest of the University of Saskatchewan in Saskatoon, for interest. This is interesting. Uh, in 1939, the Rockefeller Foundation sent her to two hospitals in Europe, such as in Prague, Dresden, Berlin, Brussels, Vienna, Athens, and others. I don't have any information on this, uh, and I did a quick look, but I couldn't find out. This occurred prior to the uh, Second World War being declared on September the 3rd of 1939. She would have gained valuable information uh, about the various European hospitals at this time, but I don't have any more information about that. This part is really interesting because I think that this was probably one of her best contributions to nursing occurred during World War II when she was appointed by the Canadian Nurses Association to conduct a national nursing survey. She was appointed emergency nursing advisor by the Canadian Nursing Association who had received a $40,000 grant from CNA to aid in the graduation of more nurses. She toured the country recruiting nurses as there was an acute shortage because many nurses had signed up to serve overseas. She undertook a survey to determine nursing power and community needs for nurses. 
She uh, warned that nurses' welfare and patients' welfare were inseparable. This resulted in recommendations on salaries, working and living conditions, and many of her recommendations were adopted. She visited every province and school of nursing in the country, and she gave numerous presentations and attended many conferences. She really uh, said that nurses know best what's for nurses. And if you want to find out about nurses, then you consult with nurses and they need to be involved and consulted. Kathleen, where are you today? We need another Kathleen Ellis. This is just a picture of the first graduation class at the University of Saskatchewan School of Nursing. And you can see her seated here in the picture. I found this interesting, a little bit of trivia, but I found out that when she lived in Saskatoon, that she actually lived at this hotel, Bestor, which was originally a CPR hotel. She lived there if she could afford to, because she was independently wealthy. And I don't know how long she lived there. It looked like she lived there for quite a while. And she entertained her friends and colleagues in the dining room. It looks really nice. <laughs> so good for her. So who actually was Kathleen? I tried to find out Kathleen the person, like really who was she? And it's kind of hard to get people who described her. She was described as dignified and gracious. We know she was independently wealthy. The other thing that a lot of people mentioned was she was known for exotic hats. In fact, she was rarely seen without wearing a hat. And she was immaculately dressed. She, Kathleen retired in 1950. She was now 68 years of age. She had a very busy career. So the question was, where would she live? Where would she retire? She had traveled widely. She had lived in different cities in the United States and in Canada. She traveled in Europe. She loved New York and New York, you know, had a real pull for her. And she thought maybe she would live in New York because she loved the city but she was drawn to her birthplace, Penticton. She decided to retire in Penticton. She purchased a house, and this is a picture of the house as it appears today. I don't know if it's part of the original house or not, but it's on the site of 268 Cammy Street in Penticton. She definitely seemed to want a quiet, relaxed life after her busy life. The house had a fruit trees, it had a flower garden. Uh, she was intrigued with housekeeping because if she lived in this hotel, she hadn't done a lot of housekeeping for a long time. So she was quite happy to look to and engage in her housekeeping activities. She was very pleased that she had neighbors who liked playing bridge. She welcomed people to her home. You could have all the fruit you wanted as long as you're willing to pick it. She served on the Penticton Hospital Board and she acted as a consultant to the RNABC and she had maintained her membership uh, until the end of her life. In 1956, a new nurse's residence at the University of Saskatchewan was named Ellis Hall in her honor. In 1955, which is a year before, she received an honorary doctorate from the University of Saskatchewan to mark the opening of the University Hospital. The Kathleen Ellis Prize was established and awarded annually to the most distinguished graduate in nursing. It was said at the time that she is known and respected across Canada for her administrative and hospital nursing service and nursing education and stated that no nurse has had greater influence. Wonderful trivia, actually. Just mention this because uh, of the Ellis family history. Uh, this is a picture of the St. Savior's Anglican Church in which she actually was a dedicated supporter when she moved to Penticton. 
as I mentioned earlier on, when I showed you a map of the Ellis property, there was a little church on the edge of the property. Um, and that uh, little, a part of that church, the chancel was incorporated into the new St. Savior's Anglican Church when it opened in 1934. This chancel is said to be the oldest historic building in Penticton. In 1966, which was a special year because it was stated that in 1866, Tom Ellis had purchased his property in Penticton. So it was a hundred years since the first European settler had settled there and the uh, city was celebrating as a centenary. So uh, at this time, the new city hall was opened and she was named Freeman of the city as a tribute to her pioneer parents. She was the only Ellis um, member of, the, of her family who was survived, had survived at that point. And she was the second woman to be made a Freeman of the city. In 1966, an historical mar marker was established, which um, was at the site of the original Ellis homestead, and it was to celebrate the Ellis family. So much of the Ellis family was centered on Tom and not on Kathleen. And this is why I kind of wanted to present something about her because all the Ellis buildings, Ellis things, people all say, oh yeah, that was Tom Ellis. But very few people, even when I presented at the museum, knew really anything about Kathleen who was much more well-known across Canada than Tom was. Um, and uh, so this, uh, and the 69 is just the brand that was put on the cattle. And that's why the 69 appears there. And Ellis, and then again, uh, the Centennial uh, Banquet was held. And again, Kathleen was the honored guest for this event. Uh, and 300 people attended this. Again, honoring the Ellis family and Kathleen being the only surviving member of the original family. None of the uh, her of her siblings actually came back to Penticton. Uh, she was the only one that returned. In 1967, she received the Canadian Centennial Medal for her valuable service to the nation. Now, in March the 9th, 1968, Kathleen died in Vancouver at age 81 after a three-week hospitalization in Vancouver. And she was buried at the Ross Bay Cemetery in Victoria, along with her parents. And this is just a picture of the grave site. And this is a plaque that is uh, at the site. And at that time, apparently, all the children it was customary to include names of the children, even though she was the only one who was actually interned there. So it lists all the nine Ellis children. This is just, um, just an interesting thing. It's just an estate sale that I found with lists the items that were on sale when uh, after she died as an estate sale. And it just shows the normal sort of items that one would expect to see on an estate sale, her personal belongings and her furniture, you know, and other items uh, were listed for as an estate sale. Tributes they came in following her death by her nursing colleagues. One of the best educated nurses in Canada, sound judgment, boundless energy, we know that, fought for better working conditions for nurses. And we know she was very monumental in that study that she did um, during the Second World War. Her ability to mobilize others, a propagandist. And this was because of the fact that she actually you know, um, gave 104 presentations when she was doing that survey and she attended 44 conferences and she was then labeled as a propagandist at that point. She promoted the development of the profession and recommended changes for the education of containing nurses and many of these were implemented. I think that she actually uh, was really an important person. She promoted the need for qualified nursing instructors and she stressed the importance of government 
consultation with nurses when faced with nursing problems and something which is facing us today. And that is the end of my presentation.